So with the do, um, I would like to introduce uh, Linda Penner. Grew up in rural Saskatchewan and has been working as a horticultural industry since the age of 16. An accomplished garden designer and instructor, Lumen has lectured at the University of Saskatchewan, the University of British Columbia, the Old College, the Calgary Zoo, and often could be heard on the Canadian radio talking about all things green and growing. Um, he also does the botanical interpretive work in Waterton Lakes National Park and is an author of several best-selling books written specifically for the Canadian prairies that I'd like to introduce to you. Thank you. How are you? Awesome. Good. It's nice to be here. Um, I know you've had a lot of information stuffed into your heads today, so um, bearing that in mind, there are notes for today's presentation, which will be in your, am I saying this correctly, in your, in which packages later? It'll be at the banquet, or the pickup, and okay. then um, after the presentation will be back here. So if you'd like to take notes, you're welcome to do so, but you certainly don't have to. Everything that I'm going to talk about will be... Uh, neatly and orderly sent uh, your way a little bit later. So uh, if you were here in June, um, I did a presentation here in June about um, common garden plants that are native to Japan. And there's so many things um, that are native to Japan that most gardeners have absolutely no idea originate there. Botanically speaking, Japan is an incredibly wealthy nation. There are so many different ecosystems found in Japan. There are so many different plants that um, that we have taken from there. And there are so many plants that the Japanese have taken from other parts of the world and improved and, and made better. And um, I'm always amazed at the diversity of things that, you know, even today are still coming out of Japan. They're still finding new species occasionally. Like it's, it's, really, it's really quite remarkable. So the first plant that we want to talk about are peonies. And who is growing peonies in their garden? Most people, if you don't have them, are, should at least be familiar with them. And peonies are so unique in the plant kingdom that they actually qualify as their own family. There's lots of things related to roses. There's lots of things related to lilies and irises and, and things like that. Peonies are not related to anything else. They are just their own, their own group. There was talk at one point amongst the botanists that they should be moved to the buttercup family, which was absurd. And fortunately, common sense and wisdom prevailed. If eventually they get reclassified, I'm going to be very upset. But for right now, they're their own family. And as a horticulturalist, it drives me absolutely nuts how often in the nursery trade, any peony that is slightly different than grandma's peony from 100 years ago is referred to as a Japanese peony. I don't know why. Has anybody else noticed this? Any peony that seems to have finely cut foliage or single flowers instead of double, so many times gardeners will say to me, I have a Japanese peony. And, the, and 10 gardeners will be referring to 10 different things under that name. So I thought we would talk about truly Japanese peonies. Peonies are, there's two species that are native to North America. There's one species that is European. All the rest come from cold parts of Asia. Most of them are Chinese, but not all. There's quite a number of them that are native to Japan. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the true Japanese peony and what the Japanese actually did. So this is, this is pretty typical of peonies. Most peonies are herbaceous. They're perennials. They start from the ground every year. They don't form woody tissue. So that is a herbaceous peony. This is Peonia tenuifolia, the threadleaf peony, or sometimes it's called fern leaf peony. It is actually European. I can't tell you how many times I have seen this for sale under the name Japanese peony. It is actually quite literally the furthest possible distance from Japan that any peony could be. So this is not a Japanese peony. Um, this is a tree peony. Tree peonies are also the national flower of China, but they come from many cold parts of Asia. And tree peonies are not trees, they're actually shrubs. They do form woody tissue, and herbaceous peonies and tree peonies, never the two shall meet. They do not interbreed. They do not hybridize. They do not get together and form liaisons. They are completely, completely separate entities, except one Japanese gardener changed that. One person quite literally did the impossible. This is one of my favorite things to talk about in a gardening class, because you can go out and buy an Ito peony, which should not exist. There's no reason for this to exist. So I'm going to look at my notes a little bit just because I want to get the dates correctly. There was a Japanese gardener from Tokyo by the name of Tochi Ito. 
I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. Please forgive me if I am not. He loved gardening and he loved peonies above all other things. And Ito was absolutely convinced that under the right circumstances, a tree peony and a herbaceous peony could interbreed. And all of the botanists and all of the experts said that is absolutely impossible, it cannot happen. After his death, his family went through his records and discovered he tried over 50,000 crosses before he ever got a seed pod. He kept taking pollen from tree peonies and putting them in herbaceous peonies and vice versa. And he did this for years and years and years. And in the spring of 1947, after working on this for 30 years, he got a seed pod. Nobody knows how he did it. Nobody knows how this happened. With all of the technology that we have today, with all of the genetic engineering and genetic manipulations that are available to us, we have never duplicated that cross. It has never happened. So he quite literally did the impossible, and he planted the seeds, and they germinated the following year, and they were actually hybrids between tree peonies and herbaceous peonies, and they exhibited something called hybrid vigor. They were actually more robust and more vigorous than either of their parents, and what he actually got was he got plants that have the growth habit and the flowers of the herbaceous peonies, um, of, of the tree peonies, but the hardiness of the herbaceous peonies. So he actually combined the much wider color range of the tree peonies, he brought that to herbaceous plants, uh, herbaceous peonies, and he made, and basically they bloom for up to six weeks longer. They have much better weather resistance. Normal peonies, if we have a rainstorm when they're in bloom, and we inevitably do, it's like dipping a Kleenex in water. The Ito peonies had much better weather resistance. They bloomed longer. The flower colors were better. He, they were literally the most incredible peonies that had, that had ever been produced. He passed away before he ever saw them flower. They flowered for the first time in the 1950s. Several of them were yellow. They were the first hybrid yellow herbaceous peonies that ever existed on our planet. And when they were finally, there was finally enough of them for sale, uh, one of them was sold to a grower in California in 1964 for 10,000 US dollars, mm -hmm. um, which in today's terms would be significantly more. It's still one of the most expensive perennial transactions in history. The most expensive perennial transaction in history is also Japanese. There was a hosta that sold for 29,000 US dollars in 2010. Okay. It's amazing what some people would rather have yeah, than they, money. Yeah. So, so, other stupid stuff. so who, is, who is familiar with the tree peonies? If you like them and you don't want to fuss around with them, what you really want is an Ito peony. So this is Yellow Crown, which was the first yellow cultivar. There was two others. There was Yellow Emperor and Yellow Heaven that came out of Ito's original crosses. So once he had, you know, need half a dozen, some were red, some were pink, and some were yellow. The Ito peonies were crossed with each other and were able to produce new offspring. So Roy Clem, who is American, he lives in, I believe, Wisconsin, is the world's leading authority on peonies. And a lot of, of the new Ito peonies have come from his breeding work. Um, the Dutch are also now doing some work with Ito peonies. Um, there, is, there is work being done with them, but they are, they are quite literally the best, the best peonies that money can buy. And before the advent of tissue culture, um, for example, Bartzella, which is considered one of the best yellow peonies that exists, and it is an Ito, um, when Bartzella was introduced in 1990, it was selling for 3,000 US dollars per division. Since the advent of tissue culture, you can now go and buy an Ito peony for 65 or 75 or $80. And I have to tell people all the time when people say, $80 for a peony, you shouldn't have this. It's a living miracle. Forget $80. Who cares? This is something that shouldn't exist. So there's a lot of different Ito cultivars, and a lot of them will actually change color as they age, which is really remarkable. This is copper kettle, and it irritates me when they spell things incorrectly for the sake of marketing. So copper is spelled with a K. Annoying. Anyway, <laughs> copper kettle, it opens almost orange, or almost like an apricot color, and depending on the weather, it can age to rose, or pink, or salmon, or coral. So a cloudy day will actually change the hue of the flower. So how the light touches it changes the color. They are absolutely the most astonishing things. This is one called morning lilac. I mean, do you not just want to lay down in these petals? Like, they're just, they're so, 
They're so amazing. I will warn you that they are addictive. Um, you can't have just one Ito peony. You should really have an acre of Ito peonies, um, really, if you, if you can. Uh, this is one called Raggedy Ann. There is a woman in Winnipeg who is extremely respected in Manitoba's horticultural community, and she has well over 200 peonies in her possession, 200 varieties, more than that. And I asked her when I was there speaking a couple of years ago, if you had to choose one peony, just one, which one would you choose? And without hesitation, she said Raggedy Ann. She said it was the most spectacular thing she had ever grown. The, fl the pictures do not do them justice. They are so, so incredible. This is uh, one called Singing in the Rain. Uh, some of you might know Shannon Phillips. She's the MLA for Lethbridge West. She's also our Minister of the Environment. She has Singing in the Rain in her garden, and it's a marvelous thing, and it opens apricot and it ages to a very soft yellow. Like they're really, these are not your grandma's peonies. Um, this is Visions of Sugar Plums, which is, a mu which is spelled correctly, so thus I'm much happier with it uh, than Copper Kettle. But if you aren't familiar with Ito peonies, you should make yourself familiar with them because it really, I mean, what a world, how astonishing that they exist. And then this is Peonia japonica. This is the true Japanese peony. It is actually native to Japan, and I believe it also grows in Korea as well. But Peonia japonica uh, is one of the very few peonies that prefers partial shade. And it's rarely found in cultivation because it is not a profuse bloomer. It, even, even a big established plant will on average produce three to five flowers in a season. They can produce as much as a dozen, but they often don't. Sometimes they will only produce a single flower, even when they are healthy and mature. So in the wild, they grow at high elevations, usually deciduous forests, dappled shade, rich, moist soil. Most gardeners don't know that there are actually peonies that prefer partial shade rather than full sun. This is one of them. Officially, it is hardy to about zone five. I suspect, based on where it is native to, that it is actually much hardier than that. Um, I know of at least two gardeners in Calgary who have this plant, and Calgary is very cold if you're not familiar with it. Um, one of them uh, is only two years old, and it's been fine, and the other is more than 10. So I think it is much hardier than previously believed, and I like the simplicity of these, of these single flowers. I love white flowers. This is the true Japanese peony, and the flower, as gorgeous as it is, is not really the reason to grow it. The reason to grow this peony is the seed pod, oh, wow. which is spectacular in every way, and it lasts much longer than the flowers. Um, you can grow it from seed. seed. From seed to bloom is anywhere from seven to nine years. So, you know, if you're extremely elderly, maybe you want to buy a plant instead of starting it. <laughs> what? What you do with your plants is up to you. Be adventurous, it's great. But I think this is spectacular. And few gardeners would think about growing a peony for the seed pods. So, and it is available in the nursery trade if you look for it. Um, for those of you who are in Canada, um, uh, Fraser's Thimble Farms is a nursery on Salt Spring Island, and they do mail order, and that's where mine came from. I bought, my, um, I bought one from my mom for Mother's Day this year. And um, I think she was slightly disappointed that it's white. Um, she doesn't like white flowers. I'm, I'm trying to fix that. So let me just change this here. So there we go. So I wanted to talk a little bit about after, after peonies. Um, we're going to just jump right into magnolias because Magnolias are so famous, and you'll notice that there aren't any in Nika Yuko. That's because it is outrageously cold and windy in Alberta in winter, and magnolias do not like that. So who has a magnolia in their garden? <laughs> One person, okay. So Japan, Japan is very, very rich in magnolia species. The Japanese have also done a lot of work with cross-breeding magnolias. A lot of new modern cultivars come out of Japanese breeding programs. It is such an iconic flower and it is such an important plant. It is worth booking your yearly calendar around something so that you can be in a part of the world at the time of year when magnolias are flowering. I make it a point to go to Vancouver every year for magnolia season. And it's ridiculous, like I'm basically Mary Poppins when I get there, because I'm just like, I just float through Vancouver when magnolias are in bloom, singing. So they are spectacular. There is really, really nothing more spectacular than a magnolia in full bloom. They are also 
ancient. There are a lot of botanists who believe that magnolias predate dinosaurs, that they are among the oldest flowering life forms on Earth. There are magnificent magnolia fossils that exist. Um, it, is, it is really, like, they are incredible plants. Uh, we have one species native to Canada. There are a few American species, but most of them, again, cold parts of, of, of Asia. This is Magnolia cobus, the kobushi magnolia, which is very Japanese. This is in North Vancouver in my friend Cheryl's front yard. And last year, Vancouver had a longer, hotter, drier summer than normal, and a lot of things that don't normally ripen seed pods actually did. I took seeds from this home, and magnolias have a reputation for being very difficult to germinate. And out of 40 seeds, I got 38 seedlings. I don't know what I'm going to do with 38 baby kobushi magnolias, but I'm going, to, I'm going to Victoria next month, and they will be coming with, and I'll just be giving them to people and leaving them on doorsteps and things like that. The, ko the kobushi magnolia does not flower well until it is quite elderly, so it's not grown as often as it might be. Uh, but you will see this in Japanese paintings. You will see this in Japanese art. You will see this... Um, there are Japanese poems about magnolias, and the way that the flower opens matters, and the way that the light touches them matters. The Japanese are really the only people on earth who have fully appreciated the magnolia, which I think is fantastic, because I go to Vancouver and people say things like, aren't the magnolias great? No, they are magnificent. They are, <laughs> great does not encompass a magnolia. So you have to, like, so if I say to a Japanese person, don't you think the magnolias are fantastic? They say, yes, and they believe it, and it's great, it's fantastic. So I'm always doing selfies with magnolias. <laughs> I'm, you know, it's, it's a thing. So, and then this one, this is another very important magnolia species. This is magnolia stellata, the star magnolia. And the star magnolia comes from very high altitudes, and the Japanese have grown it for centuries. It is one of the hardiest magnolias in the world. Um, it is actually hardy to almost minus 30. Um, it's really, really hardy. And Lois Hall, who some of you will remember, um, she was the, uh, the lieutenant governor of Alberta for a while, and she, um, she went from selling surplus vegetables out of their barn to building a gardening empire. So she's a very, very smart businesswoman. And when she, when she published a book about her favorite trees and shrubs, she said, oh yeah, you can totally grow magnolia stellata in Alberta, no problem. You just treat it like a tea rose, and you mulch it, and they bloom really well on young plants, which is true, they do. Young, young star magnolias will flower you know, when they're wee little. That, that's true. I do not know a single Albertan who has ever had a star magnolia flower in their yard. So I imagine that Lois Hole sold many a star magnolia <laughs> based on the fact that it was in one of her books. I don't know anybody who's actually cultivated it here. But it has, it has become so important, uh, not, only, not only to the Japanese, but horticulturally, this is one of the most widely grown magnolias on earth. And it is absolutely the Japanese who we have to thank for introducing it to cultivation. And you can see why they're called star magnolias. They're really, really quite wonderful. So this is a Japanese maple. And if you want to be really, like, really pretentious and snotty when somebody talks about a Japanese maple, you can say, which one? There are 23 species of maple native to Japan. So you can throw that around and just take that fact and make it famous. Because <laughs> Japanese maple is not, you know, sort of, I mean, we use it as a catch-all title. But there's many Japanese maples. And most of them are, when, when somebody talks about a Japanese maple, they are referring to Acer pomatum. And there are three or four other species, which I've written about in your notes, um, that have been hybridized with each other, and cultivars and selections have come from them. We have a very hard time growing Japanese maples in our part of the world. And the reason that we have such a hard time growing Japanese maples, and they are not strictly Japanese either, I will add that. They also grow in Korea and Japan and Taiwan. There's, there's lots of them. They're coastal trees. So even if you had a Japanese maple that could survive 40 below, we are so far inland it is, we really do not have the climate for them. It is extremely rare to find Japanese maples in the wild more than 10 kilometers from the coast. They, they don't do that. They did not evolve or adapt to deal with our oven-like summer heat and our dry scorching winds and our lack of abundant rain and poor soil. They like acidic soil. They don't have to have it, but they like it. 
Uh, they like moisture. They have really big root systems, which anybody who, has, who does bonsai can tell you, they will, they will get big roots when they're happy. It's really one of the most magnificent things in the world. And one of the things I like to tell people about maples, there's about 250 species of maple. Every single one of them is beautiful. Not every willow is beautiful. Not every poplar is beautiful. Not every oak is beautiful. Every single species of maple that we share our planet with is gorgeous, all of them, which is really, for such a big group, is really interesting. So I can understand why we have coveted Japanese maples for so long. And now you can buy them at Costco or Home Depot, and gardeners take them home, and they go to so much trouble here to try and overwinter them. I know people who mulch them like tea roses, and they'll die to the snow line, and they, you know, it's alive, it's okay. It's, all right, if that makes you happy. I know people who grow them in pots and winter them in cold storage rooms. I know one gardener in Calgary who, when she takes her vegetable garden out, she has a Japanese maple in a big pot. She lays it down, and she digs a trench, and she buries it, and then she digs it out again. And like, If you want to do that, you can. Gardeners are, are innovative, and you will find ways of overwintering this. Book a flight to Vancouver if you want to see a Japanese maple, or go to Japan, go and see them in the wild. You don't have to spend the rest of your life fussing over a Japanese maple in a climate that they are not suited to. Like, it's, it's really, it's not fair to the Japanese maple to try and make them survive in that fridge. Like, it's, why would... We haven't touched upon the feelings of the plants yet. So, so, you know, like... This is, this is, I mean, I took this photo in Victoria, and this is blood good. This is one of the most common cultivars. A lot of them are grown uh, that have purple foliage or red foliage or orange foliage or, you know, they really are spectacular. Um, this is full moon, which, I mean, it, this is so beautiful that, I mean, it really, when you see them in real life, it defies description. Who has seen Japanese maples in full, full color? Who thought it was boring or sort of okay? Nobody. Because it's not, it's amazing. They make very good bonsai, um, if you have the patience for it. Um, I don't. There's also um, Japanese maples that are referred to as, um, this is the dissectum group, and have really finely cut, really thread-like leaves. Uh, they, don't, they don't really suit us. Now, having said that, because I live in Alberta, I have to find ways of often, because I've, I've been asked to you know, I'd like an Asian, in, you know, inspired theme in my garden. Great, that's wonderful. And Niki Yuko is actually a fantastic example of working with the climate that we have to create a certain look. You don't have to be a purist. These are amur maples, which you see changing red out here. And the amur maple comes from northern China, Mongolia, Siberia. Um, they're fine textured. And they absolutely, in this garden and in this climate, can fill the role of a Japanese maple. So you don't have to, you know... Punish yourself and go to a great deal of trouble to try and grow a Japanese maple in a climate that is ill-suited to them. There are substitutes available. The Tatarian maple is quite similar. In fact, if you look at the older gardening reference books, they'll often tell you that the Tatarian maple is a variation of the Amur or vice versa. DNA evidence has suggested that they are, in fact, separate species. I can tell the difference between them if they're together. I find that amur maples are often a bit wider than, than the Tatarians. Um, the University of Colorado has done some very good work with Tatarian maple and has introduced um, two very good cultivars. One is called um, Rugged Charm, Rugged Charm or Rugged Beauty, and the other one is called Hot Wings. And the maple keys, the seeds, which are winged, this is where the name comes from because the seeds are so, so hotly colored. Um, you know, so you can, you can certainly use amur maple or a Tatarian maple instead. In our very heavy prairie soils, amur maple is prone to chlorosis. They do get, which basically they get really pale and veiny looking, but it is a really good substitute. This is a Tatarian maple. Let me just make that a little bigger. Um, this, is, um, this is in Saskatoon somewhere, and it is actually Japanese people who live here, and they have trained and carefully shaped and pruned this tree uh, for many years uh, because it reminds them of home, and I think that's fabulous. Uh, because for all intents and purposes, it is filling the role of a Japanese maple. We can also grow the Korean maple. This is Acer pseudosiboldianum. So this maple is at the very northernmost limit of its range to grow in Alberta. In the wild, it will grow about 15 feet. Here, it will get to be maybe somewhere between 3 and 6. I know of one in Calgary that's about 8. 
It looks very much like a Japanese maple. It does need a very sheltered location. Fall color ranges from bright red to pumpkin orange. Um, there was one in Calgary, close to where I used to live, that was about 12 feet, and it was the biggest one in Calgary that I knew of. And in December of 2011, somebody got really drunk and went speeding through a residential area on a very icy night and went through somebody's front yard and took down the Korean maple. So, you know, that's why um, my wine consumption is so ridiculously high. <laughs> so that's fall color on the Korean maple. And it's, it's something you can legitimately grow here. I've also used, um, this is the golden elder called Sutherland, uh, which came out of Saskatoon in the, in the 1940s. And I have used that in a landscape design once in place of a dissected Japanese maple. And I have also used this. Um, this is trossed dwarf paper birch, and it only grows about four feet. And it's difficult to find in the nursery trade sometimes because it's hard to propagate. But it is a low-growing, shrubby birch with very, very fine leaves. So it's something that's bone-hardy that you could totally use that would be absolutely acceptable. So if we're going to talk about Japanese plants, we have to talk a little bit about Philip Franz von Siebold. Who has hold of him, heard of him? <laughs> Nobody has heard of him. Um, you probably have and have not realized it. So interestingly enough, von Siebold was a German-born, English-educated, Dutch-employed gentleman in the uh, 17... He was born in the late 1700s, and he died in the 1860s. And so he was working for a Dutch merchant company. He got stationed in Japan, and he was, he was a physician. Um, he, was, he was a doctor, and he was employed there. And he was also a naturalist. And... No Westerner ever had such unmitigated access to the plants of Japan at that time period as von Siebold did. And so he was living in this Dutch trading post on Honshu, I believe, and he sent plant after plant after plant after plant back to Europe. He was so in love with Japan and its people and its landscapes and its, like, the, he was so passionate about Japan, he actually married a Japanese woman in secret. Japanese women were not allowed at the trading post, except for prostitutes, very discreetly. So his wife, who he married in secret, she would dress as a prostitute, and she would discreetly go and visit him, and they would go botanizing together in the, in, in the Japanese countryside. And so he had this forbidden love. Somebody really needs to write a screenplay about this, like badly. <laughs> like, like, really, this needs to happen. So. Siebold was always, always finding plants, and a lot of Japanese plants, he was the first Westerner to identify them for science. So, and there came a period in von Siebold's life when his wife died very abruptly and suddenly. Numbers of people say that she was poisoned. Um, I have found differ differing accounts of this on the internet, uh, and he was then accused of being a spy for the Russian government. He was banished from Japan in, um, what year was he banished? Uh, in 1823, he was forced to go back to Europe and spent the rest of his life pining for Japan and for his lost wife. So we owe so much of, of modern Japanese plant names to him. This is Clematis florida varsipoldii, named for him. He was the first person to discover this Clematis in the wild. Hosta Siboldii is named for him. Who has this in their garden? Mm -hmm. Anytime you see Ziboldii in a Latin name, the plant is Japanese, and he identified it. This is Sedum Ziboldii. There are at least two dozen plants that bear his name, and most gardeners have absolutely no idea who he was. So the Japanese actually, he was also the first person in the world, the first Westerner, excuse me, to see Bleeding Heart in the wild. He sent that back to Europe with Robert Fortune who was famous for stealing tea from China, which is another good story. But Bleeding Heart is Japanese. He was the first person to see it in the wild and say, this would be a fabulous garden plant. So that's very cool. And in 1996, the Japanese government honored him by featuring him on a Japanese postage stamp. So he's a very, very important figure in Japanese horticulture, and most people have no idea who he is. So we're almost done here. I think we have two more. So. Um, if you are familiar with this plant, this is Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, this is Erysema trifilum, which comes from the eastern part of North America. They're sometimes called cobra lilies. 
and they're not the easiest thing in the world to grow. They like very rich, moist soil. They need a sheltered site. They have to be protected from the wind, and they're not beautiful. Um, they're interesting. This is the flower. So everything in the Arum family, you know, has the spathe and spadix. So it's Diefenbachia, calla lilies, and thuriums. That's what's in this family. So the jack in the pulpits are starting to make their way into the nursery trade, and there is a Japanese species, uh, Erisema sicochianum, which is one of the most sought-after collector plants in the world right now. Has anybody seen this? I bought one at Thomas Hobbs Nursery in Vancouver, and I paid $80 for it in a six-inch pot. So there's a reason it's a collector's item. They have really beautiful foliage that is often marked in silver. It's a very, very handsome foliage plant. Grow it like you would a hosta or a fern. Rich, moist soil protected from the wind. Most of the literature is about it says, again, zone four, zone five. But based on where it is native to, it should be able to withstand much colder temperatures than that. The problem is it's really too expensive to experiment with it very much. Mine has wintered for two years with no trouble. In the shade? Uh, what's that? In the shade? In the shade. So, and it's, um, it's in some composty soil that is as rich as cheesecake. Like, it is, it is happy. <laughs> So, and it should be for that price. But, you know, this is so beguiling and so interesting and so bizarre. That was the first flower that it ever produced. And you could miss it because it's not flashy, it's not showy. Um, the Japanese love plants that are interesting rather than beautiful. Uh, as, or as much as they love things that are beautiful, that might be a better way of saying that. Um, but it really is just the most bizarre, interesting, and compelling plant. It is so compelling, in fact, that Georgia O'Keeffe painted it. Mm -hmm. At a time when barely anybody in the world knew what it was, she actually did four paintings of this plant with each painting being uh, more close up than the next. So Georgia O'Keeffe is one of the most uh, incredible artists ever. And she painted this obscure, strange Japanese perennial decades before really anybody in the horticultural trade even knew what it was. So I think that makes it very special. And then the last plants that we're going to talk about are morning glories, because this is a very typically non-Japanese plant. And so what I understand is that in Japanese culture, morning glories represent summer, or they symbolize the summer period of the year. So most prairie gardeners are familiar with morning glories. This is heavenly blue. It's been available since the 1930s. It's a very common annual vine. Um, or you might know um, Pearly Gates or Scarlet O'Hara. There's lots of them. But the people who are doing the most breeding work with modern morning glories are the Japanese. And the most exotic and interesting cultivars of morning glories ever introduced have been coming out of Japan for the last 20 years. And they are working their way into the nursery trade. This is Cameo Elegance. I have also seen it listed as Rose Silk. I did not find it to be a particularly profuse bloomer, but it has marbled leaves and these beautiful rose flowers. The flowers are also smaller than some of the old-fashioned morning glories, but it really, really is interesting, and that came from a Japanese company. They've also introduced this one. This is chocolate. And I don't really quite know how to des describe the color. Um, some would say it's a dull red, which is already an unusual color for a morning glory. Some have said it's sort of a buff pink. Um, and the color, again, totally is determined by light. So it's really... Um, that's a close-up of the flower. It's really gorgeous. I have seen these seeds for sale at Walmart on the McKenzie seed rack already. So, but most gardeners here, we go and we buy the things we know. We like to buy what we're familiar with, and a lot of us are afraid to experiment and, and get into something a little more exotic, but it is absolutely out there, and it is, um, it is definitely a Japanese morning glory. I can't sleep at night until I possess this morning glory. Um, I must have this. If somebody has a way that I can get seed for this, I, I must have it. This is Kikio Snowflake. And Kikio Snowflake, I think, has to be the most beautiful morning glory that has ever been introduced. I saw this at a trade show two years ago, and I had to be sedated. Like, look at this thing. <laughs> so, like, how gorgeous is this? Like, why would you ever grow heavenly blue ever again when you could have a Kikio Snowflake instead? Really? So it's still so new. Like, look at this. Like, do we need a moment with this? Like, so 
I have been, because it is so new, it's not really in the nursery trade yet, but it's coming. Add it to your list of things, like to your bucket list of things that you must have and grow before you die. So this is, this is a Japanese morning glory, and the Japanese are typically modest about their morning glory achievements. You, you don't see a lot of horticultural magazines trumpeting about you know, the new Japanese morning glories. They're very modest about their work, and they shouldn't be. This is, like, this is, um, this is amazing. This is another one that's, that's increasingly available. This is Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji has been available for a long time, and it is popular in Japan. It has not become popular here. I don't know why. In fact, I had somebody say to me once when I grew these, I don't like these starry morning glories. They're odd. I said, you're odd. So, <laughs> um, this is, exactly, that's right. And then these last two, um, there's not very many flowers that we can grow that are mauve. There's, we have lavenders and we have dull purples and we have violets and blue violets. There's very few that are mauve. Is anybody familiar with Christopher Lloyd? I mean the British gardener, not the actor from Back to the Future. Christopher Lloyd was a very, very influential British gardener who passed away about 10 years ago. And he actually wrote an entire chapter in one of his books about using mauve in the garden. Like it's really, it's something. But, Wed this is Wedding Bells, and there is also a Japanese name for it. Wedding Bells is the literal translation of its name, and it's a very large morning glory that looks a lot like Heavenly Blue, except the flowers are much closer to violet. It is actually that color in real life. It's really a subtle, beautiful color. It's a bit unusual for a morning glory, and it's certainly unusual for an annual vine. I don't even know of any sweet peas that are this shade of mauve. It's really really quite lovely, and it's definitely working its way into the trade. And the last one is this lovely icy blue thing. This is Wisteria Girl. And I actually really quite like some of the direct English Japanese translations. Um, I don't know who the Wisteria Girl was, um, but I like her, and I like her morning glory. So um, it's just this lovely silvery violet, rain-washed blue. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning glory. So. I'm going to open it up for a few questions and, uh, and discussion because there's only so, I mean, I have only a short period of time, so there's, um, there's only so many things we can discuss. But I wanted to, to do a little, a little introduction to um, some of the more remarkable things that Japan has contributed to the horticultural world and some of the things that we aren't growing but should be. So um, are, are there any questions or is there any comments or, yes? What is your garden? Um, well, I've only lived in Lethbridge for a short time, so I'm over here in South Lethbridge, but I garden for a lot of other people, so I garden vicariously through quite a number of people. Clients say to me sometimes, why are you putting this in my yard? Because I love it and I don't have a place to grow one. <laughs> so that's, that's why you're having that plant. So, so if you come and see my garden in the next two or three years, I'll have something to show you, but I'm still... I'm still working on stuff, and there's still a lot of stuff that lives in containers that I look at and say, I know, I'll, I'll find a home for you. They're all like little orphan Annie at my house where <laughs> there's my rhododendron, and there's, you know, my Japanese spirea, and there, you know, there's always things that are living in pots that shouldn't be. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not far from the college. Lethbridge. Yes, Lethbridge, yes. I lived in Calgary for the last eight years or so. Um, so I had a lovely garden there that after I moved, I couldn't bear to go back and look at it. And then two weeks ago, I did. And um, there's a camper park where my garden used to be. Oh. I thought about burning the house down. <laughs> I didn't do it, but I thought about it. There are lots, but I can't honestly say that I've done any, any real research into it. Um, there's a lot of very interesting Japanese tomatoes. Um, they have done some really good hybrid tomatoes in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, the Japanese have also done some outstanding work with cucumbers. And there's also really fabulous pumpkins that the Japanese are working on that um, are not really known here yet. The Japanese have a black pumpkin. I can't even handle that. I don't, like, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Um, it's not available yet, but when it is, I will probably devote the rest of my life to cultivating it. So, yeah. How about the watermelon? 
The Japanese are, you know what, the Japanese are credited with uh, introducing seedless watermelons to the world. They were the first people to ever develop a truly seedless cultivar, and they're doing a lot of work with, with not just watermelons, but also with cantaloupes and honeydews and like the charente melons. Um, they're doing a lot of work with melons. Um, I don't think a lot of them would be suited to our climate. I think most of the melons that Japan is working on would probably be things that require a much longer season than we can offer them, but I don't know that for a fact, um, because some very good short season varieties have certainly come out of there, so, um, it, you know, who knows? Maybe one more? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because of the climate and all, I know that there's some problems, but do people use uh, what we call in the States like a high tunnel uh, to try to moderate some of the temperatures and all? I mean, basically just an enclosure, a greenhouse, or you're still growing in, the, in your native soil? Yeah, soil. like we, have, we use cold frames here, and I mean, some people have greenhouses. I have a greenhouse, which I'm very happy about. Um, people here go to extraordinary lengths to extend the season and grow things that they're, they shouldn't grow. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff growing in Lethbridge that has no business being here. So I often tell people, just plant it and see what happens. Uh, there is a huge walnut tree on the north end of the city that has no idea that it's not in Abbotsford. There is, you know, there are huge, there are huge sumacs here. There are smokebush here. We have, we have honey locust here. We have, there is a very nice looking ginkgo down by City Hall. There, like, there's a lot of things that grow in Lethbridge that really shouldn't, that are really out of zone. So usually what I tell people first is try it. And if it grows, great. And if it doesn't, then we can talk about maybe finding a way that, can we make it a little warmer? Can we make it a little colder? Can I get you anything? A little phosphorus, perhaps? Like, what, what do you want, plant? How do I make you happy? Um, so it's, there's, there's lots of places in Lethbridge that you'll drive around and you'll see people have draped nets or burlap or, um, you know, I saw one yard that had about two dozen umbrellas after a hailstorm this year where they had all been stuck in the ground and opened and it was like, <laughs> and it was, it was great. I was like, you know what, that, that was somebody who probably had very little time to get out into the garden and do this before the hail came. So well done. Um, but on that, after the well, b before she was trying to protect them from getting, yeah. you know, destroyed. So um, on that note, um, I hope this was fun, and thank you for your attention, and uh, I will see you at the banquet tonight. Right. Thank you. Oh, cute. Thank you. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't know how anybody couldn't get excited about this stuff. Like, how could anybody wake up in the morning and be bored when there's Kikyo snowflake morning glories in the world? Like, 